Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the OSHA 3030 with Monish Raff. I'm Monish Raff uh, here at Keller and Heckman, and I'm grateful to all of you for participating in today's OSHA 3030. Uh, I will say this, that is a preliminary uh, welcoming announcement. I'm thankful to all of you for all of the years of support for the OSHA 3030. This is, August is our anniversary month, and so, so effective with this episode, we begin our eighth year of running the OSHA 3030. We've done it every single month for the past seven full years and without missing an episode. And uh, we think that that is due to your support, your continued support of the program, and also your continued uh, willingness to participate in spreading the good word about the program. All of the episodes from the past seven years uh, of the OSHA 3030 are libraried on our website at khlaw.com slash OSHA3030. And as well, for the past few years, we've been doing this uh, as a webinar and then reposting the recording as a podcast so that if you miss it, you can take it on the go and just subscribe to the OSHA 3030 as a podcast and it'll automatically get downloaded. Uh, on your favorite podcast streaming app. But again, the the magic of surviving and thriving for seven full years as a podcast and webinar uh, is thanks to you for every time you've gotten the the invitation to participate in the next OSHA 3030, I've asked that you forward it on to three others within your organization and in other organizations. And many, many of you have risen to the challenge, have forwarded on the invitation so that others may learn of this program. This program is something we do for clients of Keller and Heckman and friends of the firm. And so when you extend that invitation to others, you expand the, the universe of friends of the OSHA 3030 and allow others to, to benefit from the exchange of information that we prepare here in this program. As I said before, my name is Manish Rath. I am a partner in the OSHA Law Practice Group here at Keller and Heckman. I'm in our Washington, D.C. office a few blocks between the White House and the U.S. Department of Labor. And I've been uh, doing this for, for, I'm in my 25th year of practice. I'll be joined today by my partner, Larry Halperin, who is also one of the partners in our OSHA practice and one of the deans of OSHA law anywhere in the country. So, so I'll look forward to him joining our program as we get started. And with that said, let's get started. Today we have a great uh, topic, the the. U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration brought citations in five different offices against the United States Postal Service. And their, essentially their allegations in all of those citations were violations of the general duty clause where letter carriers were allegedly overcome by heat stress or heat illness due to what the agency alleged was excessive heat uh, conditions. We, during this program, will try and understand OSHA's position regarding to uh, heat stress as an uh, environmental condition. Uh, we, we think that it's important to talk about the general duty clause and as well when bringing uh, claims or citations uh, against an employer to understand reasonable notice provisions. We'll try and uh, describe uh, the, the arguments on both sides uh, OSHA's arguments as well as the United States Postal Service's arguments in its own defense. And the administrative law judge, the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission's administrative law judge's decision uh, after hearing those arguments. And, and how this implicates for you, the employer community, your uh, reasonable expectation as, as to what OSHA enforcement sh might look like in the future with respect to heat illness. And finally, as we always do, we'll wrap up with a discussion of what employers should do in light of these cases. Uh, it's topical because we here on the East Coast just wrapped up a fairly lengthy and severe heat wave, the most, the longest number of days in excess of 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in a row. I think that was a record setting uh, number of days. But right now, as we speak, there is a another record-setting heat wave on the West Coast, and I believe the all-time planetary high temperature was set uh, only a day or two ago in California, 
And so, so heat stress is and should be on the forefront of every employer's minds as they manage their safety and health programs because of its um, importance to employers who have workers outdoors and workers indoors with high heat and indoor environments as well. Uh, and in addition, on a totally separate matter, the United States Postal Service finds itself on the front page for, for budgetary reasons. And so, so it's a topical decision uh, or set of decisions. Really, these were five cases that were consolidated uh, from around the country. I will be discussing just one opinion coming out of Martinsburg, West Virginia, the U.S. Postal Service uh, outlet at, in Martinsburg, West Virginia. But there were uh, four others that were consolidated. There was a hearing in the district here in, in Washington, D.C., for consolidated evidence. So all five cases were consolidated for settlement discussion purposes. The U.S. Postal Service was unable to reach a settlement with OSHA. Uh, and I, I can't say that I'm surprised given the positions that the two sides took. And so it went to a hearing, a 12-day hearing here in D.C. on consolidated facts and a list of witnesses presented evidence during 12 days. And then each of these cases broke out into individualized subsequent hearings. I believe the Martinsburg, West Virginia hearing had an additional five days of hearings, and then uh, an administrative judge, administrative law judge, issued a decision. It was an 86-page decision. So as you can imagine, when you multiply that by five cases, these, these were collectively uh, cases of considerable weight. And uh, the discussions ranged from the complexities of the logistics of running the U.S. Postal Service to the complexities of establishing heat-related uh, exposure as a occupational safety and health hazard. So let's start off with West Martinsburg, West Virginia. In Martinsburg, West Virginia's post office, there are, as with many other post offices, at least two types of letter carriers, rural letter carriers and urban letter carriers. These get subdivided even finer into letter carriers that are full-time staff, those who are part-time, those of the full-time staff who are what I'll call in baseball speak pinch hitters that rotate around to handle the sixth or seventh day of a route and, uh, and as well when letter carriers are sick or have overflow, overload, uh, burdens of, of uh, delivery. And then, of course, as you may have experienced yourself, there are other post office employees that are in the outlet. They are the, the front desk clerk or have other sorting duties, etc. A rural letter carrier has to handle taking their routes mail and then sorts them in the office on their own. Stand on their feet, they have a cubicle, air-conditioned, and they sort the mail in an order in accordance with the houses on the rural letter carrier's pathway. And then they collect them into totes, move them onto their trucks, and, they, and, and that's about a three-hour process of sorting, and then they begin a three- to five-hour process at least of delivering. On August 13, 2016, a letter carrier was from the Martinsburg, West Virginia Post Office, was on her route after having sorted in the office. She began her route in her postal vehicle. And as she went through her route in the August 2016 heat, she began to feel dizzy. Then she began to feel symptoms of nausea. Then she started sweating profusely. And then she stopped sweating altogether. She went back to a house of a couple who she had, with whom she had struck up a rapport and had been on friendly terms, and she knocked on their door. Immediately upon opening the door, the residents of that house realized that their letter carrier was in a spot of bother, as I'd say, to borrow a term from Phil Liggett, and brought her in immediately, had her sit down, brought her cold, uh, cold drinks, and called her supervisor and said that their letter carrier was uh, appearing to exhibit signs of heat-related illness. And the, the supervisor uh, asked first whether or not she was okay to continue her route. They said they didn't think so. He came out and made a visual observation, wanted her to go on her route. She didn't believe she could. Uh, 
that was her report back to her supervisor, and so her supervisor drove to the hospital. She was admitted to the hospital, and she stayed there for several days, uh, whereupon she was discharged uh, and, and continued to experience some symptoms uh, thereafter. Uh, because she was admitted to the hospital for several days, the, the employer, as is required, self-reported to OSHA, and OSHA went out and just conducted an inspection. Uh, subsequently, they issued a citation, as they did, as I mentioned earlier, in four other locations. And, and they, uh, OSHA issued a citation alleging that the U.S. Postal Service, in that instance, had failed to, um, had failed to identify and take abatement measures for exposure to what they allege to be excessive heat conditions. So as I mentioned, these cases were consolidated and they went to trial. In order to better understand their citation and their allegations of a violation, it's probably best to start off with a discussion of OSHA's heat stress policy. And then I think, uh, as we've done in many episodes before that involve the general duty clause, we ought to discuss the general duty clause very briefly and the four elements of the general duty clause. So to start with, let's talk about OSHA's heat stress policy. Uh, there is no specific standard in the OSHA, U.S. federal OSHA standards for heat stress or excessive heat. I should point out what many of you already know. The OSHA law scheme is divided into the federal OSHA uh, law as well as state plans. There are 20, uh, half the states, 25 to 26, depending on whether you're looking at uh, private employers and gov uh, government or just government, have state plans. And those state plan states have developed their own OSHA regulatory schemes. Uh, so, so U.S. OSHA does not have a standard for excessive heat. They have considered one since almost the date of the agency's inception in 1970. By about 1972, the agency was already dis discussing excessive heat as a, an environmental condition that ought to be considered for, for rulemaking. Uh, but in the meantime, in the intervening 40 years, well, almost 50 years, OSHA has relied on the general duty clause for enforcement where they believe that the employer, uh, that an employer has, has neglected to manage the uh, occupational safety and health of workers with respect to excessive heat. Uh, the agency has issued guidance in the form of uh, an OSHA quick card, an OSHA fact sheet about heat, uh, excessive heat exposure. Uh, they, they have pointed to the National Weather Service's heat index as an ad, outside resource that employers should consult, and they've issued interpretation letters, uh, a number of interpretation letters with respect to heat, excessive heat exposure in the construction industry, excessive heat exposure in other industries, excessive heat exposure when dealing with personal protective equipment, respirators, uh, etc. And so there are interpretation letters out there that shed some light on OSHA's view with respect to uh, environmental heat. And in addition to their OSHA quick card and OSHA fact sheet. Uh, in addition, the NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, the research uh, arm uh, of the Centers for Disease Control, has issued a criteria document for heat exposure and has issued recommended uh, conditions for uh, a standard for, for, heat, uh, for heat, excessive heat exposure in the workplace setting. I mentioned that there are state plan states. Uh, you should know that there are three states that have issued a standard specifically with respect to uh, environmental or occupational exposure to heat, excessive heat. California, Washington State, and Minnesota have all issued heat related standards through their state plan, their state OSHA plans. And ACGIH has issued a uh, threshold limit value on excessive heat as well. And that is a consensus standards organization that has issued its own TLV uh, for heat exposure. Okay, so that's where OSHA is with respect to, to uh, heat, uh, heat exposure. As I said before, up until now, their method for enforcement has been to bring an allegation under the general duty clause, which is a clause under the act itself, the statute, 
that says that if there's no standard that's specific to a specific alleged hazard, then OSHA may issue a citation under its general uh, under its general duty clause, which is a clause that says that an employer has a general duty to make sure that the workplace is free of safety and health hazards so far as is practicable. Larry, welcome to the OSHA 3030, and thank you for joining us. Any thoughts on uh, the general duty clause elements before I get into them? Well, the idea is you have a supposed to be a hazard that's recognized as likely to cause serious physical harm or death, and there's a feasible means of abating them. Uh, there's a clearly understood in the scientific community idea that at some point in time there's too much heat, and there's there's no doubt about that. The question in this particular case focused on whether those conditions actually existed. And from a, an appearance standpoint, you know, OSHA went after cases that on their face seemed like they made sense because there were people out under hot conditions that reported symptoms that sounded like they were related to heat, but as you go through the case and the decisions, you find out that OSHA never made that case to this, never satisfied its burden of proof. And we'll get into that as we discuss this further. And that's a tricky uh, thing to prove when you're talking about heat stress. Uh, compounding this is that OSHA has been relying on the National Weather Service heat index, as I mentioned on the prior slide. That, that heat index requires as a prerequisite that we're talking about conditions where there's prolonged exposure to the heat condition and that there is strenuous activity uh, that, the person's being, uh, that the person is engaged in. OSHA has to prove that these are terms that an employer has with clarity and understanding as to, to how much uh, exposure is prolonged and how long uh, is prolo constitutes prolonged and how much activity constitutes or how strenuous the activity has to be to constitute strenuous activity. In addition, uh, as, as you note here, Larry, the agency also has to prove if it's trying to establish a general duty clause that the employer knew or could have known of the violated condition. And, and part and parcel of that is trying to establish that the employer knew that we're talking about an activity that was too strenuous or that the temperature was too excessive or that the exposure was too long. Uh, so that's a, a good point. I'm glad you brought it up, and we will get it a little bit more into these concepts as we go into understanding the parties' separate arguments. Let's start with OSHA's arguments. Larry, as you know, OSHA's argument was when you look at the National Weather Service's heat index, that should put employers on notice as to they should they should now reasonably be able to reasonably anticipate that that at certain temperatures and humidities that there is excessive heat which puts you into various categories of of danger and that given the National Weather Service's heat index, there the employer should know whether or not an employee might be exposed to a hazard that could cause serious physical harm or death, which is one of the elements of the general duty clause. So OSHA brought on a host of uh, testimonial uh, evidence, in, particularly in its 12 days of uh, trial here in Washington, D.C., for the joint portion of the, of the uh, five citations contests. And they had experts testify that the National Weather Service Heat Index was generally recognized. Uh, an expert testified that he relied on it and that he understood it and believed it to be clear. Uh, and they had experts testify that, that if an employer believed... Go ahead, Larry. Uh, I'm not sure. What I was going to say is OSHA tried to prove the case two ways. First, it said, here's some actual heat exhaustion or heat stress cases, heat stroke, heat exhaustion, whatever, actual cases where they've been diagnosed by a physician and determined to have that particular condition as a rule of heat exposure. And then in addition to that, OSHA said, beyond 
the actual cases themselves, since the agency in theory doesn't actually have to prove there's an illness to prove there's a hazard, uh, they said the National Weather Service heat index is basically a recognized standard, and if you're, you know, exceed a certain level, then you're basically deemed to have excessive heat. Um, that was the approach that OSHA took. Uh, there was a, uh, if you want to call it a battle of the experts, where OSHA's physician was convinced that these cases were heat-related, and the Postal Service expert was convinced that they were due to other medical conditions, um, being dehydrated, having um, some sort of a viral infection, a, a respiratory infection, somebody who apparently was taking a particular drug and two to four times the normal dosage and had been dehydrated. And so when when the smoke cleared from all that, the judge said, oh, sure, you haven't established more likely than not that these conditions are a result of heat. Postal Service, you haven't just demonstrated more likely than not that they aren't, but the burden of proof is on OSHA. And since OSHA hasn't carried its burden of proof, um, these particular cases are not, have been shown to the court satisfaction, the judge satisfaction to have been caused by heat. So they went by the wayside, and then OSHA was left, um, in effect, trying to establish that the National Weather Service heat index was effectively a standard like a pill, and that if you were above a certain level, you were in a condition or a risk zone where it was a recognized hazard. And that that was basically the argument that OSHA made, um, which, you know, after some discussion, and if you go through the analysis, uh, the experts were asked, well, what's the scientific basis for this this National Weather Service heat index that you're relying on? And nobody was ever able to actually produce the underlying scientific substantiation for it to validate it. Uh, and, and so it's, it's an interesting uh, set of points you're making, Larry, and I'd, I'd like to parse through some of them a little bit more, just rephrase them a little differently. It's, it seems, as I read the opinion, that OSHA put a lot of weight into the fact that that the well, let's just take the letter carrier in Martinsburg, West Virginia, that she in fact suffered from the symptoms that are consistent with heat illness to establish that there was a allegedly excessive heat. And I, I think that the lengthy discussion that the ALJ had to devote to this was unfortunate because as you point out, and I think you're quite right, it really wouldn't matter whether an injury and, or an illness ensued for a hazardous condition. It merely is necessary for OSHA to establish the presence of a hazardous condition. And then OSHA points to the National Weather Service's heat index to point to the abstract alleged fact of a, an excessive heat condition. Uh, so, so it doesn't seem to me to be necessary to point to the fact that the letter carrier uh, suffered from symptoms consistent with heat illness if you have to nevertheless prove, and OSHA does nevertheless have to prove, the presence of an underlying hazardous condition. And so in doing so, so it wasn't necessary, and in doing so, they, they pointed to the National Weather Service's uh, heat index chart as evidence of what a hazardous condition would look like at given temperatures and humidity levels. And the next point you made was also extremely important. When in the examination of the evidence, experts testified, they said, I looked and looked at where the National Weather Service came up with this data and how they categorized various bands of uh, levels of, of risk, and they didn't seem to have any underlying, uh, and I'm going to put that slide up right here, um, they didn't seem to have any underlying data to support why one band was red, orange, yellow, uh, or light orange, and why they, they would have been granted caution, extreme caution, danger, extreme danger status. Uh, so that put OSHA behind the eight ball, as you say, it's ultimately their burden to establish that uh, 
there was a, a violative condition. And without the data supporting the National Weather Service's table, they, they didn't meet their burden to show that the presence of the National Weather Service's table is proof dispositively of an excessive heat condition. Uh, so I think that, that that was a fair parsing out by the attorney of uh, the uh, administrative law judge. And I think that it was, it was well handled because this was a, a massive body of testimonial evidence to get through and still come to that conclusion. Larry, ultimately the ALJ's findings uh, were, were extremely instructive for the employer community. And as I pointed out before you joined us, this, I, I have to point out for those joining us today, this is important stuff, not just for employers who have workers who work outdoors, but for many, many employers who also have workers who work indoors but exposed to indoor sources of heat as well for prolonged periods of time. Uh, so I, I, I think that the impact of these cases is, is extremely far-reaching. So the ALJ's findings, amongst other things, were, as we discussed, the agency failed to prove that the illnesses in these five cases were caused by exposure to excessive heat. Uh, in each one of these cases, the, the letter carriers also had uh, confounding factors associated with their symptoms, such as, uh, Larry, you mentioned uh, underlying medical conditions, medications, et cetera. And so, so with those confounding factors, the experts were not able to establish beyond a reasonable doubt that the symptoms that are consistent with heat illness were indeed caused by excessive heat. Right. Now, just so we're clear, so we're talking about more likely than not. Yeah. Um, OSHA, I think I've mentioned, has a historical position that you take an employee as you find them. So it could be if there's some group of employees that are more susceptible to these things, the employer is not necessarily going to be able to say, well, those people are susceptible and that's not covered by the general duty clause. But in this particular case, like I said, um, it wasn't a matter of somebody had a reduced resistance to the heat and the heat overcame them. This is a scenario where as far as the judge is concerned, these people just simply had other medical conditions and they weren't based on heat exposure at all. Now, again, that the, the findings may not uh, reflect what you want to call the, the truth of what the situation was, but as far as the way the evidence was presented, that's what the judge found, that the, the evidence didn't demonstrate that it was more likely than not that these illnesses were heat-related rather than being caused by respiratory infections and dehydration from overuse of a particular drug or taking a drug in excess of a recommended dose or whatever the other conditions were. There were, there were a number of them. So um, you know, everybody has to be careful about these facts and remember that um, the case turned on the way they're presented. And it could be that and the judge said uh, in both cases the two experts were so adamant in their position and didn't didn't do enough of an explanation of explaining why the other position was wrong that they weren't the judge basically wasn't particularly persuaded by either one so it could have been with a different presentation that got into more detail it would have been easier for one side or the other to make out a case. The problem for OSHA is they get these reports of these kinds of things. And, and what you see now is if you, to the extent that you want to try to make the case out on actually causing an injury, you have to do a fairly detailed medical examination. That takes a lot of resources. And that's not something that normally gets done at the very beginning of a case. I, I would bet more often than not that the agency gets this information that the emergency room said somebody was affected by heat and they go ahead and, and go off in that direction. And it isn't told, you know, you go through discovery and get ready for trial, but you, then you find out about all these other medical conditions. And by then it's too late. You've already invested the resources in going ahead with the case. Um, and again, the same thing with the National Weather Service. Um, if OSHA is going to pursue this kind of thing again, this judge's opinion seems to make it pretty clear that the agency is going to have to do the research 
to validate the National Weather Service heat index or look for some other alternative. But they didn't carry the cur that burden of proof this approach. Right. Right, and I think that's going to be a difficult challenge. Uh, in the and that's one of those things about the general duty clause that makes it harder to, to establish, and it makes this a kind of environmental exposure that uh, also makes it difficult to to engage in rulemaking. With that said, Larry, should we talk a little bit about heat stress uh, in the interest of time? Maybe a, maybe a short discussion of it because I think setting aside that the employer prevailed and by the way the employer prevailed in the last landmark case relating to heat stress which was Sturgill decided by the review commission itself by the now chairman of the review commission um, and Jim Sullivan uh, chairman Jim Sullivan and, uh, th and that that decision uh, was also one in which the review commission found that this idea of how at what point heat and humidity or other environmental conditions become such that they are excessive for the purpose of the general duty clause uh, is is ill defined and that OSHA has not done a sufficient job of defining it to have enforced it in that case either. Uh, so with that said, that that is not to say that heat stress is not an important consideration for employers in managing the welfare of their workforce. Uh, we've found that the agency's position has been fairly consistent over the past 40, 50 years on the subject, and that's that you you have to, as an employer, consider not only the the ambient heat temperature, but also the humidity, the kind of work being performed, and as well uh, the personal protective equipment that are that the employer expects the workforce to uh, to use. Uh, the radiant heat, whether the employees are working in direct sunlight or in shade, uh, these kinds of factors need to be accounted for by the employer in order to account for and develop a reasonable practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So this basically just, you know, this is the NIOSH approach, and it talks about here's the heat balance, and if you generate heat more than you use for external work, it's going to build up, and then you have all these environmental factors that determine whether you get a heat exchange toward the body or away from the body. And the point is that there's science to this, and it takes calculations, and it's complicated. And the National Weather Service Heat Index is a nice simplistic way that supposedly tells you how you feel. And that's not necessarily tied to the science of what the actual impact of the heat is on your body, and that's the whole point of this, which is you know, NIOSH goes through this and says, here's how you do an analysis of the heat, and here's what NIOSH says basically needs to be addressed if you're going to address heat, and here's you know, our comparison of what the National Weather Service heat index addresses, and you can see that it, it doesn't address the significant number of factors and partially only addresses some of the other ones that NIOSH points out. So. The point there is, if NIOSH is correct, and these things are all relevant, and this National Weather Service Heat Index doesn't address them, then it's up to OSHA to say, well, the factors that aren't addressed aren't that significant, or that somehow that the ones that the hazard index uses are an adequate proxy for the ones that are missing. And it could be the case, but the bottom line is OSHA didn't establish a scientific basis for that, so it it just basically failed to carry its burden of proof, and I think this, this set of cases makes it clear that they've got a lot of work to do if they want to go down the road of relying on the heat index, and quite likely they need to turn and look at something else. One right. way or another, they've got to get a sound scientific basis for whatever approach they're going to take, and the recognition is it's complicated. It's not and a simple thing that, where you can plug into you know, temperature and humidity and say we're done. But even, Larry, if you take that complicated set of factors, the, the bottom line in, in everyday practical application, as you know, is that every employee is just going to experience these conditions differently. And it's not just because of underlying conditions, and it's not just because of medications, but just because of the natural variation between people uh, and as well what they've been acclimated to. And acclimatization right. is an incredibly important feature in the ability to endure a given set of circumstances uh, relating to heat as well.
So what does this mean for the future of OSHA enforcement now that they've lost five cases uh, with the U.S. Postal mm -hmm. Service and uh, coming on the heels of the Sturgill case? Well, the general duty clause, as you note, Larry, is going to be a lot more difficult for OSHA to bring a heat exposure uh, case uh, uh, forward with. And I think, as you note, they're going to have to rely on uh, external sources better than the National Weather Service's charts or ones with better underlying data to support them. One right. possibility might be the ACGI HTLV for heat stress. Uh, then there's always the possibility uh, that after almost 50 years, the agency might develop a, a, a standard on the heat exposure. NIOSH has set forth criteria for recommending a standard that was already four years ago. And uh, earlier this year, I think it was last year, it was around uh, middle of last year, May, Congress at the uh, Workforce Protections uh, Subcommittee held hearings uh, for a proposed bill, H.R. 3668, that would have proposed to require that, age, that OSHA publish a standard within two years after the passing of that bill, uh, enactment of that uh, uh, proposed bill, and it would require the agency to propose a standard addressing heat exposure, uh, and if they failed to do so, then they would, the agency, by force of that proposed bill, would be forced to, uh, to adopt the standard, the regulatory schema of the most restrictive state standard uh, in place at the time. Right now, there's only three, as I mentioned, California, Washington State, and Minnesota. Uh, but they would have had to adopt one of those schemes as an interim final standard uh, while progressing towards the final standard. Uh, and then there's a petition before the agency to, uh, to implement or promulgate a, a rule uh, that was a petition authored or signed by no less than 130 different groups and maybe 70 or 90 individuals, including two former assistant secretaries in charge of OSHA. Uh, and, and that's quite significant. And, and it's a pre predicate or a precursor to possible, a possible lawsuit against an agency. Uh, as we've seen in prior episodes of the OSHA 3030, including last month, I believe. So, Larry, what should employers do in light of the United States Postal Service's cases? I thought the United States Postal Service did a great job in, in presenting a logical and principled defense. With that said, I don't think anyone doubts that the heat exposures of their workers is very important to the health and safety of of our workforce uh, at any, any establishment. Uh, I think to start off with, employers need to conduct a hazard assessment with, relating, with relationship to heat to identify the tasks being performed, the exertion necessary to perform those tasks, the conditions in which people perform their work, and what options you as an employer have for breaks, job rotation, et cetera. Uh, and then to evaluate the feasibility of various types of interventions like uh, making sure that employees or workers have plenty of water, rest, uh, access to shade or cooled uh, environments, uh, rotating them through cooled environments or shade and uh, rotating them through breaks, uh, making sure that employees are properly acclimated if possible or at least studying the feasibility of that. That came up in the Postal Service uh, cases. And, you know, it's a problem. If somebody takes a two-week vacation, they may come back having lost some acclimatization they may also come back in the midst of heat waves. Heat waves, of course, force rapid acclimatization for everybody all at once. And so, so it's a feasibility challenge, without a doubt. And, and I'll note that, that the administrative law judge found that it was not realistic or practical to expect employers to rely solely on acclimatization uh, with logistical operations as massively complex as the Postal Service you know, Larry, the Postal Service has uh, over 33,000 retail outlets, more than Walmart, Starbucks, and McDonald's combined, uh, over a quarter million workers, and on a 24-hour cycle, they're getting mail to every single mailbox, business, and residential uh, across the country, some places by, you know, truck, train, plane, seaplane, <laughs> and so, so to deal with the logistics there and also with this idea of acclimatization, as a sole source of uh, how to manage heat is, is uh, probably a bridge too far and for many other employers as well. 
Well, there's, there's a lot of complication, though. Now we're talking about people that used motorized vehicles in part, at least a significant part, to perform their jobs. Some of them are air-conditioned. They, you have windows that you can open. There's issues about whether the trucks were actually parked in the sun versus someplace else, uh, whether the windows were opened. It, it, it's a lot more complicated, but uh, the ACIGH TLV does have some screening devices that people can use to give themselves ideas that are probably thought to be reasonably based. Um, so it's, it's not just a matter of guesswork. People could try those things out and see how they work, and I think they probably find right. they're fairly practical. I mentioned we had one indoor case where OSHA got a complaint about heat, and we used the ACGH TLV guidance to demonstrate that uh, the exposures were below the levels suggested as being fine uh, under that approach. And and OSHA dropped the investigation. So those things are available. Uh, as I, we mentioned in a slide before that, I don't know how it's going to work out. There is some technology for actually measuring core body temperature out in the field, whether OSHA could take that kind of expensive monitoring device out into the field and use it remains to be seen. Um, I assume employees would be willing to cooperate, although that would certainly be voluntary to have somebody put a a couple uh, measuring devices or sensors on their forehead, but you know, those things may happen and they may actually provide the agency with some sort of data to support some sort of a standard or an index, which they currently don't have. I think other things, Larry, that employers can do, in addition to training heavily for supervisors and workers about heat stress or heat exposure, is enforcement of supervisor compliance with those policies and having separate reporting channels so that employees can bypass their super supervisor if necessary uh, to, to report excessive heat exposure or heat illness-related symptoms to make sure that, because one of the things that came up in the U.S. Postal Service cases was a belief or an allegation that the supervisors were aware of cases of uh, heat exposure and were indifferent or felt pressed to keep uh, schedules and keep people in, uh, engaged regardless of clear signs of potential jeopardy. Uh, and then for, in order to also solve for that problem, to monitor employees directly by passing supervisors on the monitoring duty and mandating breaks. Uh, well, with that said, I think that those are some of the things that employers can do in the field of heat stress uh, management. Uh, more between now and the next time we meet a, a relating DOSHA law can be caught on our Twitter channels, including at Rathmanish. This program will be re-podcast as, uh, rebroadcast as a podcast in just about less than one day. Larry Halpern, I know you have a LinkedIn page, as do we all, and the law firm's uh, Broad, Keller, and Heckman Workplace Safety and Health page on LinkedIn. And we'll be back uh, as, uh, as the OSHA 3030 has another episode in about 30 days. September 23rd at 1 p.m., always on a Wednesday, always at 1 p.m. More information can be found at khlaw.com slash OSHA 3030. When you get that invitation, please forward it on to three other people within your organization, without your organization. Even if you've already done so, find three more people to forward it on to. Spread the good word. Starting next month, as we begin our eighth year, we are moving to Zoom to do these webinars as a, uh, a webinar by Zoom with a video component. Uh, so, so I'm excited about that. I think that's a great development. You'll no longer need to dial in separately by phone and uh, participate with the slides by webinar. Uh, we'll be on Zoom, and everything will be all in one place. So look forward to that. September 23rd, we'll be on Zoom from now on. Our sister programs, the Tosca 3030, Reach 3030, and FIFRA 3030 have programs scheduled coming up October 14th for Tosca and FIFRA 3030s. Uh, sorry, Tosca and Reach 3030s. And as I said, we'll be back in September 23rd. Larry Halpin, thank you very much for joining the OSHA 3030. I've really enjoyed uh, working with you on this program. Thank you all. Well, thank, thank you to my staff at Keller and Heckman who supported today's episode. And thank you all who are listening and who are forwarding on these invitations for supporting the OSHA 3030 as we have our anniversary today and we begin our eighth year uh, of putting this program on. We look forward to seeing you next month. And until then, Stay safe.